Welcome back everyone to another Funded Traders podcast. Joined with me today, one of our new portfolio asset managers, Martin, welcome yep. to the podcast. Happy How are to you? be here, excited to get stuck in. Definitely, mm -hmm. and I thought I'd just do it a little bit different this time. Normally we go into people's journeys, into their stories. I would love to actually dive into what is the next step for you. Mm -hmm. You've just become a portfolio asset manager. You've been trading for a period of time. What is your initial response that when you passed, was it, I want to get to the next level? What Talk me through that thought process. Yeah, interesting question. I think first I wanted to kind of take it in. I don't want to rush the process. It's, it's a good milestone. I think I'm far from the end product in terms of being where I want to be, but it's still like an accomplishment I want to be able to appreciate. So I think for me, it's more so accept this. I want to continue to scale up. So I've got this uh, obviously passed on the, the Falcon internal fund. And I've got a third party fund as well, my, my personal capital. So the plan is just focus on those, start to build those up to around the half a million pound account. And then my kind of future plans is Trading was never meant to be just kind of just trade, just become a full-time trade. I've never really agreed with that because what, what is a full-time trader, right? It's exactly. someone that, for me, I spend an hour on the charts a day, be a very boring lifestyle set because obviously I work at a nine to five at the moment. Without that, I'd be very bored. So only so much golf or gym you can actually do in the day. So for me, it's more so finding my next passion, which is actually property. Um, so I want to kind of use trading as like a vehicle to build that cash flow into property, start to invest in that work and spend my time a bit more wisely. So as the few plans. So firstly, build up the on my capital and the trading fund, then start to, to build my business with the property as well. I like that you touched on not being a full time trader, because what does that actually mm -hmm. mean? It's something we talk about in Falcon a lot. I don't actually think it's a good idea for most people to even pursue full time trading. So much margin for error. When you really think about it, you give the average trader who's got 100k decides to quit their job, and then goes suddenly to just looking at the charts all day you'd almost be worse off. Mm -hmm. So for yourself, it looks like you've got your head screwed on when it comes to property. When it comes to that, are we talking uh, residential, commercial? Are you looking to uh, buy to let, do HMOs? Mm -hmm. Have you got a plan for that? Yes, yeah, so I think initially I want to kind of get put my foot into the property industry, maybe learn a bit through like service accommodation, give that a try. I guess in terms of the profit margin, it's going to be a lot smaller compared to a kind of bigger unit. So after that, start to build up my knowledge and then start to look at flipping houses, and which is something I'm really interested in. Buy to lets, I've, I've got a few friends who have got into that industry, not doing as well. It's potentially kind of a market that it's a lot harder to, to do well in that. So focus on the flipping. And then I know a Falcon obviously doing their um, property fund as well, which mm -hmm. I'm really excited to get involved in as well. So I guess there's multiple different avenues in property that the kind of the list is endless, you know, but I think more down the flipping side of things, being hands on, I think that will give me the opportunity to kind of get involved in the property, go see it, kind of PM that. And so for example, when I do eventually leave my my job, mm -hmm. I won't just be sat on my hands and need to I'll have like a, an idea of what to do, right? So I can go into the property, speak to builders, speak to plumbers and actually start to, to kind of develop the, the PM skills which are required to, to do that yeah project management mm -hmm. is uh, absolutely crucial even when you just look at businesses as a whole it's not usually the business itself it's how it's run mm -hmm. you know how healthy it is and how you can just plug a project management system into anything and do far better than someone that might actually have more knowledge about property you could have someone who's very disorganized but they might know a lot about property whether mm -hmm. it's you know deal sourcing um arbitrage of you know not even using your own money and using something else they might have that but if they're not organized and structured they will lose so much profit within a deal mm -hmm. without even realizing it so you can transfer those skills that you've learned to take it to that i think that's going to be absolutely great mm -hmm. so let's say yeah. you've got 500k and you're building your passive income when mm -hmm. it comes to the property and things like that after you've flipped a few houses have you got a goal further than that or are you going to focus mainly on right trading's my vehicle and property is like my kind of passion, but also makes money and interest as well. Yeah, interesting question, because I know some people like to set five year goals. For me, I think just kind of, I like to focus on maybe my first year, second year, like ha obviously have the vision, have an understanding of, of on the macro level where I do want to end up. I think for me, I just like to kind of take the baby steps and be able to appreciate those. Because when, for example, if I'm like, I want to make a million pounds, because I'm quite far away from that, let, let's focus maybe on 100K or having a payout of 20K first before starting to focus on the long-term vision. So for me, it's just having those kind of incremental steps before the end goal for, for me it, it's quite weird actually my end goal is always to have like a kind of a mansion I think I, I wouldn't say I came from a bad background but not the best background so that's always been very important to me like raising a family mm. in a nice home in a nice area of London so for me that the end vision has always been just kind of having that really big nice house um, of, of course want to kind of take my family look after them maybe it could be nice restaurants nice um, nice vacations mm -hmm. um, etc so that's kind of the end goal is to, to look after my family 
And I know we've spoken about this before, what is your why? My why is most definitely, maybe it sounds quite cliche, it was just freedom. I never mm. actually got into trading to, to make millions. That was never the objective. And I think that's actually probably kind of saved me in the long run. It's always just been to have that freedom. So I know we spoke just before um, the camera started rolling is the fact that I went down very much the corporate um, route. So went to mm. university, did my master's and then started um, in the corporate industry. And I've never had a negative connotation towards that. I've always seen that as a positive, so I can mm -hmm. use that as a vehicle to continue to grow my own trading capital um, to then use that to go into potential other invest investments. So I never wanted to be like a, a full-time trader, I guess quite a cliche term, just to stay at home, not being too active. Always wanted to be someone who's very kind of like a structured and has like discipline because funny story actually, maybe like a year ago, I actually had a, a, a week off work and um, I, I still traded, but there was no reason for me to potentially have to wake up on my for my 9 a.m. meeting. Mm -hmm. And I quickly realized there was a lot of friction. Now I was like, okay, I don't really have to wake up, maybe have a line for an extra half hour. And I quickly realized without the structure, I was kind of not necessarily falling apart, but I wasn't as like in the perfect frequency as I'd like to be when trading in the markets, having that discipline. So I think I'm, like kind of comes past and parcel. I think people try to rush too quickly to just, I want to be a full-time trader without actually understanding what does that actually mean? You know, what, what does a full-time trader mean? Exactly. Um, so just a very interesting question you asked. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I love the, the freedom part. It's exactly mm -hmm. why I got involved in it in the first place. I think more traders would have an edge if they came in with that mindset. It's one of these industries that we're in where if you don't focus on money, you end up making money quicker. Now, quicker might still be four years, but you will certainly make money quicker mm -hmm. than somebody else that you can sustain it. You might get lucky and get fluky here and there, but you know, actual sustainable growth to have the freedom, I think that is the end goal. And if you've got your why, you know, you know what you it seems like you want to look at the kind of finer things of, of life, and that's absolutely fine. Even if it is the restaurants, the travel, and more luxury, why not? A lot of people start to demonize these things because they think it's superficial. It's not necessarily because you're not trying to find happiness in a Ferrari, for mm -hmm. example. You just appreciate certain things cost more, right? And if you want the flexibility to not be queuing up, mm -hmm. you know, for two hours to get on a plane, then you work hard and you put yourself in a position to be able to then say, right, I can now take my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I can live in a safer area. Like it's these things that I think people should strive towards versus how can I make as much money as possible? Yeah, and I think just on that note, I think that's why Falcon are doing it so well is mm -hmm. the fact that I was quite lucky to have never got into like the signal services or like, do you wanna make a thousand pounds a day? Because kind of in hindsight, looking back, it just doesn't make sense. And those people who are kind of over leveraging, I don't really see them being profitable in the long term. I think the reason at, at Falcon, we're, we're focusing on, let's say 5% a month is actually mm. considered good. And I've spoke to people in the industry and they think that's quite low. And I think if you can just consistently make 5% a month, that, that's a huge amount to me. I don't think you need to be making these like 200 return on investment, which is just ludicrous because exactly. realistically to make that in the long term, I think is near to nothing possible. Yeah, mm. if, if it was that easy to be making those sort of returns, think about how many people would have been snapped up mm -hmm. by the biggest funds in the world. So exactly. You can just make 70% casually like that. But we could do it. We could get an account with low amounts of money and we could definitely make 70% and we could do it live. But can we do it consistently month on month? Can we do it with uh, two million pounds in the account and keep doing 70% a month? It's virtually impossible, which is why you, you'd you be the, world, you're the richest man in the world mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. So people don't do the numbers. And I think that's the smoke and mirrors of this industry. Digging into that topic, has there been any, I know you didn't get into the signal service side, has there been any other smoke and mirrors that you've seen in the industry that maybe you don't particularly like, that you don't think is actually a reality? One's returns, is there anything else about the industry? Um, I think the lifestyle is almost, if you're a trader, you're expected to own a, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or have a penthouse. For me, my friends will laugh at this. I'm just not materialistic in the slightest. Like, for example, like having the most expensive clothes or most expensive watches, I just have zero interest in that. And I think there's this false reality in trading that if you're going to be a trader, you're going to be buying a Ferrari every week, which unfortunately is not actually the case. Some people have other goals, other aspirations. I know you've got people like Warren Buffett. I think he still lives in like a, a 200,000 pound the house. same house, yeah. Yeah. So I think people have different interests and different passions. And I think when you see on Instagram or TikTok, these kind of these small reels, right, of people making huge amounts of money in trading, it makes it very toxic for people coming into it. And I think, unfortunately, there's probably far more skilled traders out there, but when they start to come into it thinking, I'm gonna become a millionaire overnight and quickly realize they don't, they probably kind of fall away from it. So I think it's, I was looking at the stats the other day and it's very interesting. I think 95% of traders fail. 
And I actually see that as a positive because if you look at someone to, I don't know, open a successful business or let's say, for example, to become a professional football player, the odds of that are actually far slimmer than the 5% to be successful in trading. So I actually see the statistic as a far more positive than people kind of actually look at it. And I think in terms of the sample size as well, say you have 100 people, they all call themselves traders. If someone just opens an account, and they, they just make a, a random gambling kind of trade. They're considered traders. So the overall sample size is completely inaccurate for, for traders in terms of success wise. I think that's a kind of huge issue in the industry at the moment. Definitely. And it would be very difficult to get the real statistic mm -hmm. because if we was to take that same logic and I love that point of view, which is a gambler who's you know put money on an accumulator is mm -hmm. effectively the same person who's got a 212 account and plays one trade that there's not much difference there. You don't know anything, you've just gambled and you're now in the trading statistic because you have an account with a broker. But if you was to get the serious people, like the people that are actually committed and get that sample size, I reckon it would be not as bad. It wouldn't be 95%, mm -hmm. it might be say 70%. It would still be a high portion of people not succeeding because most people will just not do the work to get to there. And we'll get into that topic in a second. However, that gives us a lot more confidence. But when you get into something as niche as a trading and anyone says a statistic, even if someone said, listen, there is a 68% chance you won't succeed, already that feels daunting because mm -hmm. it doesn't look like it's swung in your favor. But of, if you can focus on being above average as an individual, you put yourself in the pole position to succeed in pretty much most industries. Look at businesses, I think it's 90% of them fail or maybe higher or they don't get past the first year when in actuality, if you can run things correctly and you can do it right, you put yourself in the top category as well. I think the statistic now is to be in the top 1%, I think it's about 70,000 pounds a year in the UK now to be considered in top mm -hmm. 1%. And they've done this survey on if someone was to pay, let's say 75 or 80,000, the happiness from 70 to 80 or not, it doesn't really no, increase yep. too much. So it shows you that once our needs are met in terms of like, you're not struggling to think about, oh, my gas bills have gone up or these, we fundamentally just want to not stress about mundane things. So once they're covered and we're comfortable and we're not thinking about, right, I'm on a variable rate of mortgage, this has gone up, this has gone up, you can actually think more clearly as to what do I want? What do I want to do? And then after you get the, the cars, that's why I sold my supercars, because generally it, was like, it just feels very hollow. And now I get excited about the smaller things. For yourself, you said you're not too materialistic. Mm -hmm. Is there any things that you value that don't actually require a lot of money? Um, huge foodie. So um, yeah, okay. I do like to go to good restaurants. Um, apart from that, traveling, traveling is very important to me. So I've, I kind of, I lived in Hong Kong for a bit and then I've got family in France. So I definitely like to kind of mm. uh, explore the world as much as possible. But um, I did have a question for you actually. I, I know sure. you mentioned about selling the car. Do you think people need to experience that level of, let's say to buy a supercar, do you think they actually need to do that to be able to then understand it's not actually worth what they thought it was in the first place? It's such a good question. Someone asked me that recently and there's two ways to this. There is the side of, yes, I do believe that you almost need to experience it to not know it. But I'm a big believer in, you know, a smart person will learn from other people's mistakes. And of course they'll learn from their own mistakes, but a wise person will learn from other, other people's mistakes that have made. I think that when you listen to a lot of entrepreneurs or a lot of people that have been wealthy that play this narrative, they all say the same thing. So there has to be an element of, right, do I want to go down the road just to say I done it, that could be ego, right? I wanna be in a position to have the Ferrari to then realize I don't want it. So I would say this, unless you're a car enthusiast and you think that you love cars, I would say fair enough, because some people they do, you know, like they're waxing it, they're cleaning it, they're hoovering it. I've never been that guy. I appreciate a car. However, I had to put myself in a position to be able to get them to realize, oh, it's not really that important. But what I would say to the average trader, which I know, unless you are a car enthusiast, car enthusiasts, learn from other people's mistakes. There's enough people telling you, it's just very hollow. Like the novelty wears off very, very quickly. And you don't need to go and get the Lambo to experience that. You can do it on a smaller and smaller level. So as you incrementally scale up, it might not be the 100K car, it could be the 6K Rolex. So experiment as you grow, because you might think I want this and I want that, start and do that and realize, do you know what, this Rolex, it has not increased my happiness at all. I liked it for a week and then it just kind of sits in the drawer and I don't even want to wear it because I'm scared to scratch it. Mm -hmm. You start to realize that, but it's, it's a good question that you say that. 
because it's very easy for someone to sit on their high horse and go, don't worry about money, don't worry about the supercars. I sold all of mine, but then they've never experienced mm -hmm. it themselves. So I get it, but I would encourage people to go deeper into you know what actually makes you happy. For you is the restaurants, the travel, looking after your family. Mm -hmm. Have you always been that way from a young age? Um, yeah, pretty much. So um, my mum was actually, so she moved from France um, when my dad and her split up and she kind of came over to the UK with me alone. So I've right. always had like a found respect for, for my mum, obviously looked after me as well as possible. So I think a kind of a big driver for me is to kind of make sure she's okay. Um, she's well looked after and obviously my friends and, and family to kind of make sure they're also looked after. So I know it for yourself, like you came from not the best background and kind of gave you that drive. And I think for me, it, it's the same. And I think uh, kind of liaising this back to rewired, like my why has always been obviously freedom, but it's also been to kind of be able to provide for other people. And I think that's what drives me. And I think I, I noticed the power of Rewired when there'd be certain elements going into my kind of trading journey at, at the earlier stages where I'd, I'd be a bit frustrated, a bit angry, like it's not going my way. And I'd be like, I'd always kind of link back to the fact, why am I doing this in the first place? And it, when you get that, the feeling and the kind of the passion, right, I'm doing it this for not just myself, but for my mom and my friends and my family, you get that extra drive where, and that's why I think I've persisted for so long. I've been with Falcon for around four years now obviously an extended period of time. There's been many times where people are saying, why are you doing this trading thing? Don't really understand it. But I've never necessarily took insult from that because people usually fear what they don't understand, right? So when they hear I'm doing this, they'll have like a certain judgment. I don't blame them for that because they firstly don't have the knowledge, but they see the kind of the toxicity from Instagram, TikTok, wherever, wherever it may be. But I think to get through those kind of sometimes harsh comments from people who are close to me, it's always been like, why am I doing this? And I kind of understood from a very early age that, to the levels I want to get in terms of financially, it's gonna be extremely hard to get to that level by just a purely a nine to five, right? So to, let's say for example, you wanted to make 500K a year. To do that in a nine to five, I think the chance of that is probably actually less than the stats in terms of um, becoming a successful trader. So that's always interested me in just kind of understanding where I want to go. So I need to understand which pathway ultimately I'm gonna to, going to have to go down. If it's not trading, then what else would it be? And personally, I do have a, Maybe it's a weird thing to say, but I definitely have a passion for trading. I know kind of it just comes down to simply clicking a buy or sell yeah. button, which doesn't sound too exciting. But for me, it's more so the, the concept of the better you are as a person, the better trader you will become. And I think that's why I like this industry. It's very different to, to any other business you could ever open, right? Like, for example, if I was to open a pizza shop down the road, so it becomes, because I'm a better person doesn't mean the pizza is going to actually sell better, you know. So I think there's kind of different like crossovers between trading and, and actually you as a human being, which actually I actually find very passionate and why I've mm -hmm. kind of stayed so, so kind of uh, stuck with the trading through this path. It's almost like trading brings a part of you out that nothing else would because you have to be such a competent version of yourself mm -hmm. to be able to fulfill the results. So as long as you can keep improving yourself, then you're destined to succeed. Where if you sold oranges, it's not going to make a difference whether mm -hmm. your, you know, mental stability is stronger than the others. You're either going to sell them or you're not. And I think the good part of that is that you've dove in to find excitement and passion within it. Because I don't believe you need to be extremely excited about every single thing that you do, but there still needs to be some element of high interest and passion, which is why even just watch lists. Sometimes when you're going through your watch list and you're building it, it's still therapeutic. And if you've been a trader and you've been trained for four years and you still find it therapeutic to kind of clear everything off, do your watch list, do your analysis, it's a very good sign, you know, for me, 15 years. I'm still just as excited. You know, I look forward to it, which you would think that someone would get bored of those things. Have you ever found that? Have you always been excited to kind of write, I'm going to get ready for mm -hmm. the week? Has that always been the same, similar sort of emotion? R really good question. I've actually never got, but it's the one thing, maybe, I don't know, if I might go gym for an extended period of time. It gets a bit boring or could be absolutely anything, but trading is the one thing where I'm not actually sure why. Mm. Um, in terms of, yeah, every day I always do my forecasting, whether it's the morning or the evening without about failure on the weekends. And say, for example, I'm incredibly tired. I'll still wake up with so much enthusiasm just to simply look at the charts. And I think my friends and family have always always noticed that and kind of found it a bit weird, but definitely something that I'm very excited about. And just on that note, I did have a question for yourself. Sure. So I've always tried to figure this out. Do you think you need to have passion and discipline to be successful in a certain field? Or do you think passion's enough to kind of get you through that? I don't think passion is enough. Mm -hmm. I think you need discipline. And the reason why is that the act of what you need to do, even with a negative mind, will still produce certain results. So say, for example, the action of being very organized in a business, but you was quite negative by nature, 
but you still done all of the right things that you needed to do for a business to function. The business would still function. Mm -hmm. Like take a property manager, for example. Imagine you meet someone very, very negative, very cynical about life, but knows a lot about property, organizes the bricks, the builders, builds the house, buys the land, sells it. Him being happy or not is not gonna make a difference whether that gets sold because it's just black and white. So the action itself of doing it is way more important. So that's where I'd say the discipline to have all these things in place is key. Passion will only get you so far, but eventually you'll lose passion because you can do, I mean, unless it's watch list, we never lose passion with that, but there's certain things that are going to become tedious, whether you like it or not. And I think eventually it's almost like a ticking time bomb mm -hmm. that you'll be like, right, oh, this is getting a bit boring. You start to lose the enthusiasm, lose the passion, but discipline's forever. So if you have both, if you can find something that you genuinely have a passion for, and you've got the framework of discipline to do with it, you become unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult. Going on to that question, actually, leading into Rewired, how has that been for you? Where, how long into Rewired did you say that you generally felt an impact? Um, probably quite early on. So I've been in Rewired for around a year now. Um, so I've gone through it multiple times and you said this many on many occasions that there's always a new lesson to, to take from it. But I think the first time I went through the content, I could start to to see the certain patterns in my thoughts. And I'm someone who used to, before Rewired, I used to love reading these self-help books after self-help book, probably read at least about 50. And I quickly realized that theory will only take you so far. And I think for me, Rewired, the reason I found it so impactful is the fact that there's the practical steps. For example, if you were learning to drive and you're just doing the theory, you're not gonna actually be able to drive without doing these practical steps. And I think Rewired gives you those tools which can actually help you to firstly identify those, those thought patterns. And for me, that was a the huge kind of aha moment in terms of there were certain negative like patterns occurring in my mind, which I didn't actually observe. Like maybe on a very subtle level, I could see them, but when I actually really paid that attention to my awareness and kind of saw what these thoughts were, how I started to feel during taking positions or post a position, it starts to become a very repeatable pattern where right. I could use the tools um, in Rewired to maybe kind of stop those, replace those and make them more positive thoughts, which I think has been a huge reason why I've been able to, to pass the fund. Um, I guess to, to how quick I passed it as well within, um, I think it was around five tra uh, trading trading days I passed it. So I think that's definitely due to, to Rewired for sure. Yeah, well, yeah. you clearly done the work, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see the difference. I remember <coughs> you from uh, coming to meetups in, in the past right you're way more confident in yourself from when i've met you before and mm -hmm. i can see that growth as well so me and the coaches one of the best things is being able to see people improve over a period of time i'm sure you've met people in the community where you may have seen it yourself someone who's kind of like shy i mean i've never seen you as someone who's shy or anything like that but you can definitely see there's more of a higher vibration in like your confidence where you're mm -hmm. going and it's, it's really really great to see how have you found uh going to things like meetups um, I think the first one, I think it was the London meetup actually, um, a few years ago, I was a bit more kind of apprehensive about that. Um, I've never actually done a meetup before, mm -hmm. but I think after you've done a few, then it kind of, it's, it's, you start to settle, settle in. Everyone's so friendly there. You've got similar passions. And for people who haven't been to one, maybe they are a bit nervous. I'd definitely push yourself out your comfort zone. I don't think I've ever pushed myself out my comfort zone and actually regretted it. There's almost, mm. you get a feeling of reward after for doing it. And you, I think you start to set your, your level of comfort zone. You start to expand that. So say, for example, I'm now going to meetups on a week to week, my comfort zone kind of expands and then yeah. I'm able to push myself to new challenges, maybe more uncomfortable situations. And there's something I, I like to do maybe on a quarterly basis. I call it kind of a, a yes month. So there, there'll be a month period where I'll be like, okay, any uncomfortable situation which arises, I have to say yes, and it doesn't matter what that is. And weirdly, there always seems to be maybe my boss, but like, right, it's time to present in front of a large group, or there could right. be a podcast or a meetup, and I, and I and I allow that that time to be like, right, it's time to kind of push that comfort zone and expand that because I know in Rewired you mentioned it, if you're not growing, you're probably dying as well. Right. It's, it's not the best mindset to have. So I think for me, it's always important to continuously grow, not just as a trader, not as just like a friend, but as, as an individual, my mindset, I want to be able to level that continuously. Yeah, definitely. Like we have to be pushing ourselves mm -hmm. all the time, whether it's mentally, physically, that like you never regret those things. You mentioned about gym before, I highly doubt if you've ever trained early in the morning that you've got there 
done the workout and thought, yeah, I massively regret waking up exactly, at five. Yeah. Like it might be difficult in the beginning, but once you're there, you don't regret these things. Mm -hmm. You don't regret after going on a podcast or speaking in front of people, no matter how difficult it is. And I think of the environment that we have at Falcon, that's why I encourage it so much. Because to give people the tools to just analyze the charts alone is simply not enough. Mm -hmm. That when I see in the industry, I think is a huge failure. So anyone in the industry that is offering as an, a genuine educator, they may not be doing it maliciously. They may have good intent as to, they have a strategy, I wanna teach it. But if you don't give people anything further than that, they're doomed. The stats are hard as it is, trading is difficult as it is. So if you don't give people the framework to actually structure their life, think about themselves, their self-esteem, like all these other things, it's very, very difficult. It's like the odds are stacked against the mm -hmm. individual because you could have the most competent trader but they're all over the place. They're impulsive, they're anxious. Like that trader's not gonna win unless they learn how to quiet the mind, be relaxed, be aware. Like you said, you noticed some thought patterns, why you was trading, pre-trading, post-trading. How does that feel for you now? You're a portfolio asset manager. Mm -hmm. Do you feel calm and relaxed when you're taking your positions? Y yeah, uh, and it's actually got to this stage where it's more so just kind of rinse and repeat. There's just mm. say it's a loss, say it's a win. There generally is no emotion there. I don't want to be naive in the fact that I guess when I do start to scale up again and again, there's going to be obstacles. I, I never wanted to take the approach where, right, I've, I've cracked it, I'm now consistent. Mm -hmm. There's going to be no hurdles. It's just going to be kind of very easy moving forward. I think that's a very bad mindset to take because when you ultimately do have potential issues in that journey. Like, okay, I thought I actually cracked trading, but now I'm having issues, it doesn't make sense and it can cause you to potentially spiral out of control. So I'm already prepared. There's potentially gonna be certain friction moving forward, especially when I start to double those accounts, but it's something, obviously you've got the coaches at, at Falcon where they're, they're gonna be there to, to make sure you're kind of remaining disciplined. And sometimes I think it's very important for maybe a kind of a new set of eyes to see the trades you're taking. Maybe you're kind of stuck in, in a bit of a rut, right? And I know people call it kind of the seeding where they might get to half a million and they find it very hard to, to move up from that. And I guess it's kind of a, a self-identity issue and maybe they don't see themselves as someone trading a million pounds. So 100%. at first, I think my expectations are I need to keep remain humble, remain teachable as well going forward. There's always more to learn and just keep on doing what I'm doing. I think um, there should be a big thing to come, especially towards the end of the year as I continue to scale. 100%. And the level that you get to, so let's say you're at 200, from 200 to 400 isn't necessarily the level that got you from 100 to 200. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that you've just got to be relaxed with. You might get to 200 or roughly around that figure and be at 200 for, let's say you was at 200 for six months. Every trader has to be comfortable with the fact that it's not just growth, 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 growth. You're going to have periods where you might actually go from you know, 60, 120, 240, and then it gets to half a million, as mm -hmm. you said, and then it starts to slow down. There's no point stressing over what that number is going to be. It's just being okay with the fact that that's a possibility. And I think you're already going in with that mindset as well to just sit with it for a little bit, mm -hmm. rather than people I see, they get funded, they get to the next level, and they're so aggressively thinking, I need to get to the next level. And it's almost like you're going to chase it until you blow it, where sometimes it's just like, right, I'm at 120K, great achievement, I've hit six figures go and celebrate, small celebration, and now just create a plan to just make sure you're deliberately doing the same thing. And you'll get there so much quicker. And I'm excited for what we're gonna do for the remainder of the year. It's been very, very fast, as you've probably seen with Q4. We've had a lot of people pass on the fund and that's gonna continuously move forward. Uh, the end of the year will be here before we know it. My question is to you as the, we're getting a lot more of a attraction to people coming into Falcon as we wanna build this community, but in the right way. What would you say to those new people and for people that have been in Falcon for a while that have goals similar to yourself that like want to get funded, want to create passive income and want to do things, <clears> not just the typical cliche full-time mm -hmm. trader from what you've used Falcon over the past four years, what advice would you give to them? Um, I think firstly, you need to stick at it. And if you're going into trade and think you're going to become a millionaire overnight, probably isn't for you, but if you believe that you can actually sacrifice the next three to four years, some, maybe two years, there's, there's no exact number for each person, but say for the next three years, not make a penny, then potentially trading is for you. I think you need to go into it with realistic expectations. It's a very hard industry to crack. And obviously when you do get to a, to a level of consistency, the rewards are on the other end. So firstly, your, your expectations need to be on track with, with what's actually viable. And I think secondly is remaining teachable. Mm. And this has happened to me many a times where, say for example, I've been in Falcon for three months at this point and I've taken three, three kind of rand, really bad trades. They've all be, uh, been winners. 
please tell me which trade is going to listen to you. Be like, no, they were bad trades. It doesn't make sense in, in the human mind. Like you're making money. Why would you be like, no, I, I need to change up my plan. So I think always remain teachable going forward. The coaches are there for the reason. You, um, Abdu and Ibi are all saying things for a reason. And that I think it's that level of intention when you're listening to the content. Don't just listen to it for the, for the sake of it to tick off a goal. You really need to be able to extract as much information from that as possible. So I'd say expectations and um, that kind of that level of teachability. Yeah, love that. Teachability mm. is so, so key. They'll progress so much quicker. So knowing what you know now, do you think that you would have got here a lot quicker? Or let, let me pose it to a different way. We said about when you're out of your comfort zone, you never regret the fact that you push yourself out of your comfort zone. Now knowing that it's been four years, do you regret those years that it's taken you four years? Or are you just happy that you're here now? Um, I, I don't regret it in the slightest. It, it, the funny thing is... Um, it's say I never wanted to get to this stage by fluke. And I think my biggest worry was just getting, I could have, I've got like a, a prop firm mm. now, now trading six figures. It was pure luck. And now I've maybe taken on investor capital from family. Could be an extensive amount. And now I'm not actually, I don't have the technical ability or mindset to trade that, but I've got to that stage by fluke. And now I believe I am. I've now lost my six figure account. I've now lost a significant amount for my family. That's never the stage I wanted mm. to be in. So I'd rather, make as many of these mistakes and failures early on before going mm. on to, to a large amount. So I think all these lessons were, were there for a reason. And um, the first time I, I failed on the fund, actually, I was like maybe a pip or two. I got taken out by the spread and I would have actually passed. But I know looking back, I wasn't actually ready to actually take on that level of capital. I hadn't gone through re, uh, rewired at that point. Technically, there was a few more kinks in the arm, which I had to kind of flatten out. So I think don't regret it one bit. And I'm sure most people will be thinking the same. They might be like, oh, how many more lessons do I have to take? But I promise you, looking back, you're not going to see that as a negative. You'll see it more so as like a, uh, a necessity going into your, into your trading career. Definitely. And imagine at that point where you're so close to passing and someone said to you, right, Martin, it's a bit unfortunate, isn't it? And you just go, right, well, maybe. You, didn't have, you hadn't gone through wide, you've done it, you've got the mental framework, and then you've passed again. The thing is, we never really know the cause or the effect that something is happening. And what can be seen as bad at that point is usually something different. I'll give you a very simple example. As I was getting the train today, I, w I missed the train, there was traffic, there was an accident. The train I was originally gonna get on would have been more complicated to get here. And then, so I, and someone messaged me and said, oh, that's unfortunate. And then I actually had that thought in my head, I was thinking, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then when I looked at a different route, it then became easier. I know that's on a micro level, but if you can apply that micro level to like a macro level, is that you might see something and you think it's bad or like, oh, you failed your funded account or you had 200K with a prop firm and now it's gone. You think it's bad, but maybe you're just not ready. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, that's the pain that you need to go through to fix the deeper issue, which is probably your mindset that when you rebuild, you're so much stronger and you're so much stronger now, which is really, really great to see. So thank you for jumping on the podcast, Martin. I really do appreciate it. Any last and final words for what your focus is just from now until the end of this year mm -hmm. as we're getting really, really close to finishing 2023? Uh, remain dialed in. Just keep on doing what I'm doing, not overcomplicate the overall process what I'm doing. I think I want to keep on looking at my morning routines and evening routines, see if there's any ways I can improve that. Um, and I think just, again, not putting too much pressure on myself and hopefully I'll be on the next podcast trading far more amount of capital, which would be good to see. 100%. Well, let's smash it.